Bye, Leslie. Bye. I'll see you later. We're live. Hey everybody, it's Mike. Hi. Hello. The uh, the message is saying that the host has stopped my video. So I've often been told I'm back. I was gonna say, here we go. Mine was confusing, Nick. I got your invitation, which Christine already had a series, so I, I, maybe the series ran out because when I opened up my calendar, it wasn't there. But when your invitation came, I accepted it. So the invitation disappears, and then it doesn't actually show up on my schedule. So I kind of had to do a cut and paste of the link, and yeah. it worked. But we just like to keep these weekly things it. exciting. Man. <laughs> and Christine, you just sent an, an invite for the next week, right? Oh, that was a mistake. That was supposed oh. to be for tonight. Oh. Yeah, I'm a week ahead. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same link. Oh. Thank you. We're new are we are we going to have a pre-town meeting meeting? No. We're going to meet at 10:30 on Saturday. Okay. There's a couple of things that may come up in the next couple of days we need to handle. Okay. Um, but then I ignore the message that I clearly just sent for next week because I don't think we're going to need to meet next week. Although we're not through tonight's meeting yet, Christine. <laughs> Today has pretty much been a day of being one step ahead of myself and three steps behind myself. So. <laughs> Let's see, now all I have to do is, I mean, that's interesting. Where did that go? Wow. Got it. Hmm. Although, as I look at it, I could have just gone to the agenda and clicked on the agenda link, and that would have been the right one, I think. So after trying in the first several Zoom meetings to show up a minute or two early, I discovered that I really needed to show up a lot more before that because I got waylaid so many times, <laughs> passwords and. Get a new laptop. I just, I just bought one at the beginning of the year. It was just fortunate timing. Like I have good technology. Did you get one of those uh, i7 chips? Uh, I actually think it is. Yeah, it's a it's a Lenovo Yoga. It's like one of the latest ones they had. I think I do, as I recall. You're asking me more sophisticated questions than I'm really fully qualified to answer. I'd have to look it up. I know where to look for it, but I'd have to look it up. Does it go, does it go fast? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes too fast. So I think we are all set. It's after seven. You can call to order. All right. Good evening, everybody. This is the Board of Selectmen meeting of the Town of Medfield for uh, June 23. Um, and we'll f disclose first that we're video recording, um, which is pretty self-evident. Uh, and then pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general laws, chapter 30A, section 18, and the governor's March 15, 2020 order restricting, imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the Medfield Board of Selectmen is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings as provided for in the order. A reminder that persons who would like to listen or view the meeting while in progress may do so by following the instructions on the agenda and the meeting notice. All votes subject to remote participation and therefore will be roll call votes. And we'll start with a, a moment of appreciation for our troops that are serving all around the world. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so first on our list of appointments is Mo Goulet, Maurice Goulet, Director of our Public Works to discuss shared road concept. Hi Mo, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Good evening, everyone. 
Um, I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about uh, South Street Extension. Right now, we're in the process of grinding and paving that roadway from Route 27 out to the Norfolk Town Line. It's all ground up right now. Uh, we're hoping to get that paved within the next week or so. Um, looking at for the contractor's availability. Um, with that being said, we're um, we're looking to dedicate and implement some uh, bike lanes into that roadway um, from that, uh, like I said, from Route 27 to, to the Norfolk Town Line. Um, we have a draft complete streets policy that we're that we've worked on, and which it's in a review process now. We're going to ask. Uh, the Board of Selectmen to look into signing that uh, for us um, in the next coming months, but uh, still going through review and want to make sure everything is right on it before we, we do it. And the idea is to kind of implement a complete streets policy to a lot of our roadways that we're designing and rehabbing and reconstructing to give it um, the uh, trying to get service all modes of mobility in town, whether it's pedestrians, vehicles, trucks, uh, emergency vehicles, bicyclists, uh, to integrate all that into our designs. So with that being said, we'd like to uh, look into dedicating some bike lanes to that South Street extension, if, if at all feasible. Um, we want to install these uh, with the necessary criteria that we need, and uh, but with safety being the number one priority. If that's not a feasible um, action for us to take, when we uh, look into the design of it, then we would uh, consider looking into sharrows, which are traffic markings on the roadways that just inform vehicles that bicyclists could be on this roadway as well and please share the road with them. And we would put signage up to mark that as well. So we're trying to, we're starting the process for the complete streets um, in our comp complete streets policy would be available, uh, uh, um, eligible for grant opportunities for a lot of different projects with uh, transportation. And um, we, put, we would put together a prioritization plan to show what the needs of the town are in these different mobility needs for the, for the pedestrians, bicyclists and vehicles. So I'm just kind of looking for your support to implement this. If uh, not the complete streets policy yet, just to start um, as a, uh, looking into dedicated bike lanes or share rows, whatever's feasible for the South Street extension at this time. Questions, Gus? Um, we, is, does this involve a widening of South Street extension? No, that's why um, we would look into the dedicated bike lanes to see if the criteria would fit for the, for the width uh, of the lanes uh, in either direction. Um, if it's not, if it's not feasible for that, we would, consider looking into putting those share rows in instead. So we would not be widening. And will this include uh, sidewalks for pedestrians as well? Sidewalks on South Street Extension are already in place. So that's already covered. This would just mainly be opening up the, 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 op the a better, safer opportunity for bicyclists. Correct. Has there been any uh, feedback from the public about this and the only, where I'm coming from, uh, what you're trying to do here, I'm on board with, but I'm also sensitive to the fact that South Street is a major commuting road. Right. Uh, so I, I have an apprehension about that unless everybody thinks it's a great idea. Well, it, like, like I said, we would, we would see if it was feasible and safe. First okay. of all, the safety is the number one concern. So if it, we don't feel it would be safe to put in, I talked to the police chief Regarding the share rows, uh, didn't, we didn't talk too much about the dedicated bike lanes, but uh, she was all for it. And uh, but uh, like I said, I wanted to bring it to your attention first before we we um, encourage that. Okay. So, so speaking for me at least, I, what you're trying to do, I, I I'm on board with. How we do it is the piece that I'm most concerned about. Um, editorially. I'll tell you that I think Wellesley has completely screwed up Washington Street with share roads where some places it's the entire lane seems to be for bikes. Other places it's a more conventional bike lane and some places there's no lane at all. Um, so I, I will simply say that editorially is that doesn't strike me as a safe, I don't, you can talk, maybe I'm wrong, but that particular configuration that they have in Wellesley on Washington Street on Route 16 
doesn't look to me to be at all safe. It seems almost designed to create confusion. I just don't know if any bicyclists actually have the gall to get out in the middle of the lane, like during rush hour, where it'd be a problem. So, uh, well, it's not. It's not so much to get out in the uh, in the middle of the roadway. That's not the idea. The idea yeah. is still to have, you know, where they should be uh, riding, but also. If we can dedicate a part of the shoulder to a dedicated bike lane, they have their own area to ride. If yeah. it's a share row, they would be riding on these roadways anyways. Yep. Um, so it's basically in kind of uh, notifying the public that pe there are bicyclists that could be on the roadway. Please, you know, mm -hmm. share the road with them. Because my observation about shoulders of our roads, when I what and having ridden a bike on the road, I sympathize even sometimes when bicyclists are a little far out from the edge is the problem with the shoulder. Most of the time as a bicyclist, you could ride you know, on the very edge of the lane, but every once in a while, that's the place where the worst you know, disrupted asphalt is. That's where the, you know, the fittings for catch basins are. And, and sometimes if you're a bicyclist, you almost have to be aggressive simply because you can't afford to get pinned in there by a car that thinks you're not gonna come out another two feet. So seems like the implication here is that we would we would be making better shoulders on our roads than we maybe have in some cases. It's, it's, it's very difficult with South Street extension. We would have to do land takings, redo the sidewalks on both sides to mm -hmm. make it wider. Um, it's just it's not a feasible uh, option for us to reconstruct that roadway for the bike lanes. It's just too cost cost. So, uh, so, cost that's, prob so that's probably you're really talking about shared lanes then. Um, if we can put in, there's, there's a, there's a formula with certain size travel lanes, certain size shoulders that you can accommodate a bike lane in them. Uh, if we could do it safely, that's one thing. If we can't do it safely, then the Shero idea is the, the okay. kind of the backup. Okay. Good. I look forward Thank to seeing what you come up with. <laughs> what, got, Mo, what, what is, what is the test for whether this is feasible or not? As far as looking at the widths, making sure that we have enough widths all the way consistently down the roadway. Uh, sometimes when we, like right now, the, the width of the roadway is 28 feet on average. Well, does that mean that there's certain spots that transition too, too narrow that we can't put the bike lanes in? Because we don't want to put a bike lane in if it's not going to be feasible in all, all aspects of that roadway. And that's why I say if we don't have the room for them, then we would consider putting in share rows for the time being. But in the future, we would be trying to incorporate as much mobility as we can throughout the town if it's feasible. And that's what the complete streets, it doesn't force you to widen the roadways to throw bike lanes in. It just asks you to consider these design aspects when you're reconstructing or rehabbing a roadway. Is there an added cost to doing it? Just line painting, it's very, very minimal. So the next step then is to measure South Street. Yep, we would uh, we would kind of uh, engineer it a little bit just to make sure that we have enough uh, uh, enough width in the roadway to make it safe for vehicles and for for the bicyclists. And if if we feel that it's it's not uh, safe to do so, then we would, like I said, consider that Shero idea where just notifying people use it as a bike route anyways. Uh, the Pan Mass Challenge uses that section of roadway uh, when they go through it and through town. But it's just to notify the, the public when they're in the vehicles that there could be bicyclists, bicyclists on the roadway as well. And is this coming up now simply because we're, we're repaving South Street now? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it makes sense to do it now while the, while the paving is being done to incorporate it uh, with the line painting instead of waiting till the lines uh, fade and disappear if we, you know, to change our minds. Um, but again, it's, it's just for consideration. I uh, want to get your thoughts on it before we, uh, we try to do something out there. I would just say my, I mean, I have no objection to it. I, I, I agree with Gus. I and mean, I would say as, as you're looking at road safety in Medfield, I mean, South Street's probably one of our safer roads, both for bicyclists and pedestrians, because it's wide. You have sidewalks on both sides. We have other roads, you know, which I know Gus knows well, obviously sections of Harding Street, uh, that are also heavily trafficked by bicyclists and, and commuters that don't have any sidewalks um, and uh, don't have any room for anything, right? So if you're looking more broadly at road safety and pedestrian safety, there's obviously other places in town that would be a greater priority. There obviously would be a greater cost 
to yeah. doing that as well. Um, but as long as this is not something that's going to preclude us from prioritizing streets and roads in town, which largely are the older streets and roads that were paved and set out before kind of having sidewalks and before the width that we have now is more standard. As long as it's not going to push those aside or prevent us as part of an overall kind of master plan for the roads, prioritizing the roads where we do need to make safety improvements, I, I, I have no objection to it. Okay. So I'm following along with the same uh, uh, approval of what you're doing, Mo. Uh, my understanding from Mike Sullivan was that the uh, uh, the governmental authorities on the state and the federal level are requiring us to to look at bike lanes on any new construction of roads that we do. So I'm assuming that that's part of why we're doing this is because we we're supposed to be doing it because of the the, the things that are imposed upon us from above. Um, it, it, you know, it, I think it's 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 more the the fact that uh, you know we're trying to uh, expand as much different types of mobility throughout the town. It, it takes some vehicles off the road sometimes. It gives people an avenue to, to travel the roadway safely. Uh, you know, we'd love to put sidewalks on every road in town. We'd love to put bike lanes on every road in town with the vehicles, but it's just not feasible on a lot of these roadways unless you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to change that. Yeah, and that's not feasible usually. So um, on, on South Street, uh, the first thing that you're talking about, the, if you do a, uh, are you talking about a separate bike lane? Correct. As the optimal, and, and that would have a barrier between the bikes and the cars somehow? It would, it would only be by line painting to oh, separate. Oh, by line it. painting, okay. Yeah, uh, but it would be the use of the shoulder for that. Um, the shoulder still can be used for vehicles that, uh, you know, in emergency situations, pull over to the side. It's not a blockade of any kind, but it's just gives a bicyclist a, uh, an area where they can ride hopefully safely to, to their destination. It's too bad when the state redid that uh, road that uh, they didn't put a bike lane on one side and a sidewalk on the other side. Uh, we don't really need a sidewalk on both sides. So, If we were to reconstruct, like Route 109, we're looking to get state and federal aid for that. Uh, we were looking into, you know, dedicated bike lanes with sidewalks as well, all the way through uh, the area that we're looking to to design. But that's, that's in the future. But uh, any roadway that we do, if we would try to consider any kind of mobility for sidewalks or bike lanes, but if it's not feasible, we just can't spend, um, like I said, hundreds of thousands of dollars right. on each street to do that. Yep. Thanks for uh, looking into it for us. Sure. Appreciate it. Yep. Anything else? Um, not as far as South Street Extension. Uh, he has a few other things on the agenda. Oh, you got some other things? <laughs> All right, go ahead. Um, really, only one more thing is the, um, the software six, user oh, agreement. The six oh no, nope, uh, that one there, that. Oh, that's still in oh. limbo. It's, we're trying to get that squared away. That'll be hopefully next week. Um, the six oh feet, uh, six oh four B grant, uh, Mass DEP is having a grant opportunity for the town for best management practices with stormwater. Um, basically, it's a it's a program. They're they're uh, giving us grant money with our match would be in-kind services uh, from the DPW. So it wouldn't cost the town anything to, uh, to apply for this grant program. It would uh, look into uh, developing best management practices um, on our town owned properties. Uh, it would look into 40 different potential sites to uh, improve, uh, whether it's retrofitting uh, detention, retention areas, controlling erosion, um, a lot of things that to, to uh, get better water quality from our stormwater. Um, they, um, they're looking to um, whittle those 40 sites down to uh, three best sites to do work. They would uh, give us conceptual plans to, um, to create these projects. And um, it's, it's around $36,000 of grant money that would come to us to develop these plans and these sites to help uh, to help give us better water quality with our stormwater runoff. Questions, Gus? Just a, just a quick one. I, I, I'm just curious whether there is a connection about, I think it was last fall, Mike and Pete, you may uh, recall the Neponset River Watershed Association sent us it was kind of a, a somewhat weird request to kind of join in them with them in some sort of a 
town, the Ponset River Watershed Authority group that sounded kind of like a lobbying group or something. It was very, it was very hard for me to understand what it was other than it seemed to have a political dimension to it. Is that, has this got anything to do with that group? We, we deferred on that. I just am. This is above this, and beyond. This is above okay. and beyond that. That's um, the stormwater partnership. We are, we are members of that consortium okay. with other cities and towns. And basically they help us with, um, with public outreach and a lot of different things to comply with our stormwater management act permit. Okay. So, um, so it's the Neponset watershed as well as the canoe river watershed in on this grant with DEP and they would, we would all work collaboratively, collaboratively to, uh, do some best management practices in town. Okay. No, no further questions for me. Mike, any questions, comments? Uh, none for me. I think I'm good with it too then. Um, okay. And we just need a, a vote to authorize the chairman to sign uh, the grant agreement. So I would move that we authorize Chairman Peterson to uh, sign the proposed Neponset River Watershed Association 604B Stormwater Program grant application. Second. Mr. Peterson. <laughs> Mr. Murby. Yes. Mr. Marcucci, I. <laughs> well, before you, is that everything then that you were going to go that's, over? That's all I have. Whatever you have, come on. Uh, I do have. Well, I'm just looking at our agenda. The two, two items down, vote to authorize town administrator to sign application to the Massachusetts Shared Streets Grant. Has that got nothing to do with you, Mo? Nope, no. that has to do with Sarah. Oh. Yep. Okay. Different. Uh, I think that's it. I had a question about the stormwater. Uh, yep. is, is, are we having to spend a lot of extra money to comply with the federal stormwater requirements, or we we probably spend between forty and fifty thousand dollars a year for to comply with stormwater. Um, there are a lot of more um, uh, pressures on us to comply. We're we're ahead of the curve a lot of a lot of the times. Uh, we do have to come up with different. Uh, plans for them to uh, review and to uh, document. They give us time frames, but um, we try to get things done as fast as we can. But um, we do spend, you know, good, a good amount of money a year. A lot of towns are spending more because they're, oh, yeah. not, they're not uh, there. So the stormwater permit is, is very uh, strict in some care, uh, cases, some, some are very, some are a little lenient, but um, we try to uh, make sure that we're compliant and then we try to do everything we can. With this grant money, I think it's gonna help us even a little further to, for impaired waters that we may be able to uh, solve some of the issues that we won't have uh, as much issues in the future. When, when the stormwater uh, new regs were being proposed, uh, Dedham said that they were gonna have to spend a million a year to comply. And, and I was surprised that, uh, that we weren't apparently gonna have to spend too much to comply, well, so it's good. It, it is good. I mean, we, 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 uh, we sweep the streets, you know, four five, six times a year where some communities only ha have the availability to do it once. Uh, we're proactive on that, clean, cleaning catch basins, doing everything we can to take some of the impurities out of the stormwater. Yeah. Okay. Mo, Mo just a question. This is just me trying to understand this issue without actually knowing what I'm talking about. So I'm just curious, if I think about stormwater management in my head, I kind of look at it as three potential things. One is getting stormwater out of our sewer system, so we're not, we're not unnecessarily overloading sewer systems. Two would be making sure that the stormwater that does drain into our rivers is clean. And three would be diverting stormwater out of drainage entirely into recharging the aquifer. From my first question, am I thinking about it the right way? And if I am, where's our emphasis? So um, right now with our wastewater treatment plant, we are trying to get stormwater out of our sewer systems by you know, fixing leaks and trying to find the culprits of where things are. So that's, that's our probably number one concern right now because that brings a lot of uh, impurities into our system that we have to treat and it goes out to the Charles River. So we're doing a, a, a real good job of that right now. I think um, with the runoff recharging the, uh, the aquifers, our, in Medfield, we are about 10% of impervious surfaces, which means it's the pavements, the parking lots, 10%. A lot of communities 
are somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 percent, mm-hmm. which they have a di- more difficult time recharging their aquifers. And a lot of it gets taken away to different parts of the town. And that's why with this grant doing like detention ponds and retention ponds, that water comes in, it seeps into the ground to recharge the aquifer, but it, it filters through and takes all the a lot of the impurities out. Um, so it's cleaner, cleaner water going through our into back into our aquifers. Okay. <clears throat> thanks. Mo, well, thanks so much for coming then. Okay. And I have one more item. I knew there was a second item. The vote oh. on the earmark for West Street and Route 27. Nothing to do with Mo. Uh, um, it has nothing to do with Mo, actually. <laughs> Um, so this was the earmark uh, that was given to us last year from the legislature. Uh, we've actually been waiting for it all year. Uh, we were just notified last week of the grant paperwork. Um, if you're willing to accept the 70,000, there's no timeline on which to spend it. And as long as it is spent on Route 27 and West Street um, and Mo's developing a budget of how we would spend that 70,000. Does it include looking at bike lanes by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> just now. <laughs> not, not this time. I just wondered, Route, Route 27 is pretty good. North Meadows Road is like, to me, the gold standard for a road that can handle bikes and cars. But, uh... <laughs> that's our intersection. That's one of our, one of our most dangerous intersections, although, so. Yep. Yeah. And I still and don't sure. understand why. I use it all the time. It's like it's. Yeah, I think the traffic lights aren't yeah. okay. as good as they could be. The yeah. traffic well lights. Positioned. The traffic lights are antiquated. Um, it needs um, dedicated turning lanes. It needs yeah. to, uh, you know, we need to reconfigure that intersection to to make it safer. That's what I meant to say, Mo. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else for Mo then? Nope. Nothing for me. And our next uh, appointment is with Jean Minio to discuss the Medfield State Hospital Chapel lease yep. potential vote to approve the lease. So last week we sent Jean off to the development committee. How did you guys treat her there, Magus? We, the development committee, except for me, treats everyone with great respect and, and concern. <laughs> no, it was a good conversation. <laughs> I think it was. You should ask Jean. Don't ask me. I was there. Jean's the one that was on the hotspot. Uh, Mark Sorrell, yes? Yeah, so as a result of that, uh, I've had communication with Gene and uh, Vicki Sheps back and forth. Uh, principally, uh, Vicki uh, revised uh, clause of paragraph four of the lease to provide language whereby the town uh, reserves the right for, to use the parking and uh, green space, uh, as well as the public, provided it doesn't interfere with uh, the, the uh, Alliance's use of the property. We worked language out, which you can see there, and then we tweaked some other language in a few other places, and I think we're all comfortable with it now. Okay, Jean. <laughs> yes. Nice presentation. Hi. Thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, Mark, Mark's got it. I just, um, you know, with that new clause four to address the shared parking. Uh, the tweaks to clauses uh, two and seven, the development committee support. Um, you know, we've been eager to get to this day for a long time. So hopefully we're all in agreement. We can sign it and move on. Any questions, Gus? Not, not for me. No, I know I worked all my mischief last week. Okay, Mike. Nope, just Jane. Jean, thank you for your patience yeah. uh, as we've gone through this process. I mean, we. For, for an agreement that we all really wanted to make happen. It took quite a while to make it happen. Seven months. So uh, <laughs> thank you to you and to Vicki and to Mark for your patience and, yeah. and, and, Steve, you know, Nolan. Getting, and Steve and everybody for yeah. getting us where we need to go in the end. So thank you. Yep. So, so do how we do a... we actually do it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that was the easy a... part, right? I think we need a motion to uh, vote to sign it. I would move uh, that we sign the lease, authorize and sign the lease as presented. Second. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Mr. Murphy. Aye. Mr. Marcucci, yes. Um, and so now we will, uh, <laughs> we'll, 
should we this this seems like something that's it's, sufficiently important we should sign it in real life signatures even <laughs> if you have to to put the lease out on the lawn somewhere we can come by I, I will bring it to town meeting on saturday perfect <laughs> yeah, but we actually need multiple copies so sounds like mark's bringing it to town meeting on saturday <laughs> great <laughs> I, I can do that. I'll, if you want, I'll, I'll run off a bunch of copies and bring them. Perfect. Terrific. Okay, great. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> See you there. Thank you, everybody. I Thanks, really, Gene. I'm Thank really you, Gene. excited. Thank you. <laughs> so, Gene, I just wanted to let you know that uh, uh, for me, a lot of the uh, uh, my enthusiasm for this uh, this whole uh, lease and, and process is uh, faith in Gene Minio. And so I just want a commitment from you to stay on <laughs> while the term of the lease is... Uh, it's going forward so i'll be here 99 years excellent thank you that's what i wanted to hear thank you thank you so next uh we have memo russ hallisey this request discover medfield day be september 26th at the medfield state hospital request a common victualers license yep. for september 26th request banner approval request summer concert series begins in july at the medfield state hospital is there anything that Russ is not looking for tonight? I don't know. <laughs> it's a great hat, though. Hi, Russ. You're on mute. You're muted, Russ. You need, you're on. All day, we'll get you unmuted. He probably just watched Jean and noticed how when she didn't say anything, she got approval for everything. So he's, he's using the same strategy here. <laughs> Okay. Still muted. Maybe do he the, doesn't uh, want to do it. Do the hosts need to do something to let him? No, we just looked and he should be able to to start. So Russ, if somewhere on your microphone, you have another switch that you don't normally use. Uh, it's usually we tell Russ between seven and 7.30 and we get to him about nine o'clock. So he might actually oh, get he's, dinner. He's, a, oh. he's in the other room, huh? <laughs> So we can go on to the next item then. Oh, no, I think, hold oh, on. He just came up. He came in, good. Hi, Russ. There we go. There he is. Uh-oh. Can't hear you. But you're not muted. Can't hear you. Hey, Russ, if you've got the uh, icon, the microphone icon in your lower left corner, if you click it, it will give you a select microphone. And if you have more than one microphone, it may be that it's gone not to the one you're actually using. It happens to me every once in a while. All right. Well, Russ, why don't we have you try and get back in, get out of the Zoom and come back in? See if that works, and then we can take Mr. Petter right now before we take Russ's appointment. Okay. Is that okay with you, Russ? Okay. <laughs> 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 okay, you work on that. <laughs> and who are you looking to go to next? I thought the next item was COVID or Chief Carrico, and right. you seem to. This, I had sent you an email. We had a very last minute addition. Um, oh, had, uh, Zeus yep. Brewing? Yep. Zealous. Zealous. There we are. Hi, Jeff. Hello. How are you? Hi, Jeff. Go ahead. You're on. Okay. Um, so I had sent in a application or stroke proposal for a uh, 
a uh, beer garden at uh, Meeting House Park, which if you don't know, you probably do know, it's on between Ferry Street and Upham Street in downtown Medfield. Um, as you probably know, breweries have been pretty hit pretty hard by, um, by uh, coronavirus. We've been closed for three and a half months straight. Um, we're trying to reopen, we have to get a food permit, um, which we're attempting to get. Um, and anyway, so we were, I put in the suggestion, we basically wanted to have it most Saturdays for the next few months. Um, I did some investigation. It seemed like you are allowed to have outdoor. Um, I mean, there are a lot of advantages of being in that kind of venue You're outside. So there's less, um, you know, safety's up. I think people will be more willing to come out. Um, and, you know, in that particular space, there's plenty of space to put the tables far enough apart. Um, the rules are generally six feet apart between chairs. Um, and obviously you need food. So I had um, talked to um, Dave Cost. Sorry, I'm looking at a little note on the side here. I, was, I, um, I talked to Dave Costabile, who is the owner of uh, Rip Republic. We've worked together before. And he just recently um, worked with, uh, I think, Bridget at the um, Board of Health. So he got sort of signed off as being able to serve um, in the town of Medfield um, under, under the coronavirus restrictions. So um, anyway, so he's on board. So basically, it'd be sort of two to eight. We'd probably start the first time two to six, um, just to see how it goes. Um, we would... We have a, our own portable bar, which we've done. Like we've done beer gardens before. We've actually done quite a few of them. We did one in Ashland. And they have a space called the Corner Spot. We were there for like, we did one for eight weeks at one point. Um, and, and, um, and many other places. So we could rope off the area. Uh, we would probably forego a tent. If it rains, we would just not do it. Um, and yeah, so we could rope off the area. We'd have to discuss, because I think the land is owned or managed, I'm not quite sure, by the parks and rec uh, department. And um, so we'd have to have some kind of arrangement with them for um, uh, removal of refuse and recycling. Um, toilets has come up as a potential issue. Um, anyway, so I, I, I put in this proposal. I, didn't have that massive expectations that you guys would sign off on it, but it is an unusual time, and I thought it would be a good way for the town to sort of come together a little bit, um, and I'm sure it would be quite well participated. So that's kind of my presentation. Good, thank you very much, Jeff. Questions, Gus? Um, just uh, actually one around the land. Uh, to Jeff's point, we, and I'm not sure Mark or Christine, given the given the lawn mowing discussions we've had in the past. Um, I believe some of the land is owned by the church and some of the land is owned by the town. So my first question, if Jeff already knows the boundaries is, is your plan to only use the town land or did you not realize that that area actually is owned by two different owners? I did not know that, no. Okay. Um, so two thirds of that lawn is actually the church. So about a third coming in from Upham Road is town land, as I understand it. So the site, the church obviously owns the two thirds, which is contiguous to the church. Mm -hmm. Correct. I wouldn't necessarily disqualify it, but it, it basically says there might be another actor in here that you need to, I, I suppose they wouldn't probably make their restrooms in the church available for you. So I don't know that you have that solution there, but. <laughs> they, they likely would not make their yeah. restrooms available. They didn't make right. their restrooms available on Medfield Day. Right. <clears throat> but, the, but the key point would be whether you can, whether they would be on board with the land. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Or whether a third is enough for you, Jeff. Yeah. I would suspect cutting a third probably is enough, to be honest with you. It's a pretty large piece of land. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you know if you, sorry, go ahead, go on. So there are issues as far as the use of town land um, for this purpose or any non-municipal purpose mm -hmm. and particularly exclusive use. 
So that would have to be addressed. Uh, yep. Mark, is that similar to when we allow Memo to use the gazebo area? Um, we the, have all kinds of restaurants using sidewalks now. Well, that's different. That's the uh, the uh, there's a, there's an enabling uh, uh, regulations, if you will, for that at the moment. In fact, that's that was part. If you have a if you have a licensed uh, restaurant alcohol establishment, you can, by reason of these uh, the regs that the governor's task force has in place, the interim regs, which the ABCC is on board with, expand your operation onto a budding property, public property or private property, whatever. And there's a mechanism for that. That's not going to apply here. So what you've got is uh, basically the issue of a, a private party wanting to use town property uh, for uh, his own purposes and, oh, by the way, involving alcohol. Uh, so that's, number one, the authority to do that. Uh, yeah, frankly, it uh, strictly calls for a lease, which would be a, something that would be required from town meeting unless you try to do it as a license agreement and as, as long as nobody challenged it, you could you could do it that way. Uh, and then uh, the issue is, well, what about others that have these type of uh, establishments and needs and would, would participate if such a program were available? Then the alcohol licensing in this case would be uh, one-day licenses as needed, I guess, because uh, it doesn't fit under anything else that I can think of offhand. He is a farmer's brewer. But that uh, only allows you to sell uh, at uh, agricultural uh, sanctioned events uh, by the Department of Agricultural Resources or to sell in bulk. So, and that's to sell in bulk. So, otherwise, you pull one day license for a uh, to to serve for consumption. Hey, Mark, how did the farmers market work at the church? Uh, Kind of informally, that was the church approach to town about doing it, and basically they were given the okay to do it, and it was left to the church to run it. So the church ran it. So that's you know that was on church property. Frankly, I don't know what arrangements they made with the various vendors. But um, are you suggesting it would be easier to use church land if they were so willing? Yeah, then you could pull one-day licenses as you needed them for uh, the well, Jeff, uh, Jeff's letter to us, Jeff's letter what? to us requests Jeff's letter to us requests one-day alcohol licenses. So mm -hmm. I, I guess the purpose of tonight was to really think about whether or not the board of selectmen were in favor of a concept like this. There's still a lot of work that Jeff needs to do uh, with the board of health. Um, I know he's got Red Public on board now, but there's still some logistics um, that need to be worked out. But we didn't want him to move forward with that unless you were okay with a with a concept like this. Speaking for myself, I am, uh, as long as you don't do it before noontime. Uh, <laughs> 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 and, uh, no, I, I am, and particularly, I mean, I, I really feel for your particular situation. We have other restaurants that at least are able to, you know, get by on a wing and a prayer right now, and ideally they'll be back in business, but you, you just opened up relatively recently and you've been shut down. So if there's anything the town can do to, to make that easier for you to weather that, I'm absolutely on board with it. I, I think, uh, and obviously there, there's complications in terms of working this all out. My, my thought as a select one would be that if we were able to do all that and approve it, my inclination would be to approve it subject to being able to demonstrate that this can be successfully managed in those first couple of weeks. So it would kind of be a provisional approval uh, subject to simply making sure that this concept works okay and we don't have problems that we didn't anticipate. But uh, all the things being equal, I think it'd be a great idea for, any, for anybody who's been downtown Boston in the summertime and has seen the popularity of the beer garden on the, on the Greenway. I guess it's more than one, but the one that's over near International Place, uh, the population of that beer garden, it's a nice thing to do in the summertime. Um, I think it could, it get, get, just given everything the town's gone through, I think it could be a good thing if we could figure out how to make it work. Thank you. Mike, did you have a general reaction, Mike? Up yeah, or down? I, I, I agree with Gus. I mean, I think we are, 
in a situ in a situation here that is but it, fill in your adjective of choice but um, they're not normal circumstances and the um, you know the last three months have fallen particularly heavily on uh, Jeff's business and I think uh, my goal here I think our goal should be to help the businesses in town as best we can um, within reason within prudence and without overly bureaucratizing it so I, I think we should try to make it happen um, I think Jeff is aware that there are restraints and restrictions and if people have objections to it we'll have to sort them out but my request would be for Mark to put together a very simple agreement that would address the concerns that he has from a legal standpoint that would would define the legal terms for on the basis on which Jeff will be doing this. I do think in fairness, we would have to entertain other proposals from other people who wanted to do something similar and to figure out a way to accommodate both if possible. Not that it would be another beer garden, but if somebody else has a use for Meeting House Pond that uh, would fit in the same category of trying to help businesses that have been heavily strained and have uh, sacrificed more than others for the the overall cause of public health over the last three months. Uh, we have to entertain that. But I, I think we should, along the lines of what we did with the tables and everything else, we should do our best to make this happen and to be as helpful as we can from a governmental standpoint. Um, because that, that's, that is all we can do, but we should try to do what we can uh, to recognize that these are very unusual circumstances. They've put uh, businesses like Jeff's in a terrible bind for, but, but for the public good and where we can help them out here, we should. We're, we're, we're losing days of the summer as we go through. And, and so I really think we should try to make this happen as best we can, recognizing that if it doesn't work out, if this turns into a circus, that it could be a very short lived beer garden. But you know, it, it being Medfield and all, and I, I was out for a walk last night at 8.30 and things were very quiet, even in all the outdoor dining locations. There was no, there was no hoot nanny going on with people uh, in Baxter Park or, or whatnot. So uh, I think we should try to make this happen and try to accommodate this as best we can. And if we can all work to make, make that happen, I, I would appreciate it. Well, the template, uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the template would be uh, a license agreement, which we had uh, with the former zebras some years ago where they were using the uh, a portion of what's now the uh, Straw Hat Park uh, for outdoor dining. So uh, the only difference being that abutted their premises as opposed to by itself, but the legal, the legal, uh, relevant legal uh, issues are the same. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, Jeff, I think I'm in on board too, and, and really would like to see the town help you out to make this uh, work. It seems like a great idea. It sounds like it could be a lot of fun for the people in town in addition to helping your business. So um, sure, I, if, you I can, think if Mark's please. working on the agreement, but Jeff, in the meantime, you reach out to Bridget from the board of health and start working with her. She has a, a couple of concerns. Uh, and I think if you can just work through the logistics with her, you can move forward. What are you going to do about parking? There's plenty of parking downtown. They'll, they'll, they'll park at Zealous and walk over. <laughs> I did, for what it's worth, I actually think the, the toughest question will be uh, figuring out the restroom question. I agree with you, actually. I think tent was the hardest, but when you don't have a tent because you just want to be open. Mm -hmm. um, but I think restrooms are tricky. Yeah. And tables, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can talk. We can talk about that way. There's a couple of things in the letter we have to talk about. Like you're still not allowed to have live music, so we can't, won't be able to approve that until the next phased opening. Um, you won't actually have, be able to have served from the bar. You actually have to have people served at the tables. But we, Bridget can work through all of that with you. Yeah, I assumed it would be a table service. Yeah. yeah. Um, but she can work. She can work. I actually just met with her this afternoon to talk about this, and uh, she's ready and waiting for your call tomorrow. Okay. And, yeah. and if you're only open one day a week, Jeff, it, you, the town may want you to move the tables and chairs to the side somehow so they're not just set up permanently for the whole summer. Yes. Um, yeah. You yeah, well, probably want to do that anyway. Our portable bars are very heavy, actually. So we, we want to, yes, we wouldn't leave everything as was for the whole time. Yeah. And you might want to talk to the church because that may be a better route for you than the, uh, than the town. So based on what Mark was saying. Anything else, Jeff, for us? Or we're wishing you good luck with it, I guess. 
Okay. I guess we have to go through the hoops and then come back and get yeah. official permission. I think so. Yeah, I think you need a more formal plan. Yeah. Well, I think I think the plan Jeff sent is okay if you worked out the logistics mm -hmm. and the details with the Board of Health. If you want to allow, I would say you're not going to be ready for this Saturday, but the following Saturday. Um, here, why don't we do this? If you can work with Bridget starting tomorrow, we may be able to do an update at Saturday's town meeting at your meeting at 1030 in the morning. And then you could approve a, a following liquor license. So Mark, that means you need to work on the license tomorrow. Oh, I've got, I happen to have it in because uh, we just dug it out for use in Franklin, so uh, I can get it to you to see the format anyway, and, and give me like a cut and paste for the information we'll need. If something which would be useful for me is if someone has a plan of the um, of the meeting house park, they could. That would be the assessors, probably the tax the uh, the tax maps would probably be as accurate as anything. The, the town, Jeff, the town has a GIS map that's online. You can go there and, and uh, you, you can get a, a plan of it from that. And that will show the division between what the church owned and what's... Uh, it should, um, yes. It should show where that line is. Okay. Hey, Jeff, if you have difficulty there, I, th I if you have any difficulty finding it, I would think uh, he could get in touch with Sarah and Sarah could, uh, you know, if, if for whatever reason it's hard to figure out the town website and figure out the maps, I would think Sarah could help them. Yeah, we can coordinate between Bridget and Sarah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. You're Thank very you. welcome. Good if luck. If you with get it. done in Good time for it. Saturday, we can get it all approved. And if town meeting makes it past <laughs> noon, everybody can just walk from town meeting to meeting house pound and <laughs> that sounds like a challenge. Kick it that off with a kick like it like off with a bang. That seems like a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, thanks for coming. Thank thanks, you. Jeff. Take care, Jeff. Uh, thank you. Chris, did you have anything you wanted to talk about uh, COVID-19 status? Let's try and bring Russ back. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Hi, Russ. Hi, little bit. Hey. hey. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, with all the Zoom meetings we I've had this summer, though this this time of year, the first time I've had a problem. <laughs> and uh, and I was going to say I love these Zoom meetings with uh, it's my only social contact out there. So yeah, glad to be with you guys. Um, so. Yeah, with this COVID-19, as it's disrupted everybody else's life, uh, it's having an effect on planning for Medfield Day. And even though that, you know, we're, we're fairly down the road, you know, September 26th, um, it's kind of still on the cusp, uh, you know, whether, we, you know, all of the openings will be allowed, whether there's going to be a second wave or not. And so, we uh, decided to uh, go ahead and, and plan it, figuring that it will happen. So as you may have seen, you know, invitations went out to last year's exhibitors with an announcement that if it doesn't happen, you know, because of COVID, everybody gets their money back and, and stuff. But, uh, you know, we can't wait till the very end to, to plan. So we are planning. And then, uh, in the midst of all the planning, the committee said, you know what, even if it's allowed an open season, you know, whatever, there are still going to be people, booth people and, you know, uh, public coming to the show and rides and stuff that people are still probably going to be concerned about social distancing and all. And so we really need to take that into account. And the land down where we normally have it in the center of town isn't big enough to allow us to spread out the booths uh, to such an extent that would uh, would be able to uh, accommodate that. So we put our thinking caps on and walked up to Hospital Hill and decided that that was a, a pretty good location to do it. Um, and if I could, I'll kind of walk you through how 
we had conceptualized the, the layout. Basically, it will be up at, inside the quad. So uh, inside there, where there's the uh, you know all the buildings uh, surround the uh, the paved uh, the paved area that goes in a circle, and then there's a couple of buildings in the middle, the chapel and whatnot. So the 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 the, the plan is to have the booths set up around the circumference of the paved area and using pretty much three, three sides uh, should be enough to allow us to have our basically about 150 booths with 15 feet of booth space. And then we could probably have 15 to 20 feet between booths, uh, which would be really well spread out if you could also picture the, and then also in that area uh, along the road to have the food court, again, nicely spread out as needed. And that would give plenty of space for all those booths. And then if you could picture the quad, the north, I'm gonna call it the northeast corner where there's a lot of grass area up there that would be where we would have the kids, kids alley. And we would modify the kids rides by not having the bouncy, uh, the bouncy uh, rides, but have more individualized uh, things that the kids could uh, be active with, where they're kind of one on one. Um, and that area, we've, we walked it off. It would be plenty of space. It looks like it's even more space than Montrose's parking lot gave us for the rides we had there. And then if you could picture the southwest corner, so diagonally across the quad from that, that's another large grassy area where we would conceivably put our tables uh, for the, uh, because that's near where I would have the, uh, the food court be set up and we can have our tables and tents set up there for our food uh, people. And again, there's plenty of space to, you know, spread out the tables and whatnot and also be the entertainment stage area. And we'd be bringing in uh, a large generator, you know, those kind of generators that are towed behind trucks for large, large construction sites. We have availability, we have available to us for one of those and then several um, portable uh, generators as needed. Uh, we would have our porta potties, uh, of, of course, our hand washing sta stations. Um, and that's, uh, and then we would also have the ability to have, so for parking, as you drive all the way up into the campus and then you kind of go to the right, there's a little parking area there where you can park and then walk onto the campus uh, quad. We would reserve that for handicap parking so that people don't have to walk a long way who are handicapped. So that would be handicap parking. Again, as you drive into the campus on that left side, about halfway up, there's another little parking lot there where we're planning on having our volunteers park so that the volunteers would always be able to, you know, should be able to uh, have enough parking there uh, to, to, to help to, to handle them. And then we would like to have parking for the public uh, in the area in the front of the campus along Hospital Road as you drive into the left there. There's, a, you turn into the left, there's a grassy area up there that events have used for parking. And then also, if you go to the right, there's also areas there for parking. I know our school buses are there. They wouldn't have to be moved because there's plenty of space for the public to park. There's that sandy area. And then also further in uh, is the uh, grassy area where the car show uh, has parked itself. So. Along that way, there's plenty, there should be plenty of space for the public to park. 
And if perchance there's a need, we could go across the street uh, where, you know, uh, uh, what's the name of that ball field? McCarthy Park. McCarthy Park. Uh, as, as soon as you go, it, like where the sledding hill is, uh, a little to the left, there's a grassy area there that's open. So that could be used for overflow parking, but we may not, we may not need that. We, I drove there and you can't park where the sledding hill is. We used to be able to park there, I know many years ago, but there are these logs now along the right side of that drive that goes in there. There are uh, big logs that are, block off your ability to drive into that sledding hill, you know, side of the hill. So that would be our parking uh, plans. Um, we would also be looking to have people not be able to drive past those initial parking areas uh, up front that I'd be able to put signs up saying, you know, no drive through except for the handicap and the volunteers, because we wouldn't want everybody to be able to go and park because of people walking around and, and limited, uh, limited parking. And then also the concern was about dog walking that we would be permitted to prohibit unleashed dogs not dogs themselves, but unleashed dogs uh, during the time that we're going to be there from like seven o'clock in the morning set up to um, four o'clock when everybody is, is, is taken down and everything. Because I wouldn't want dogs to be running around the event uh, unleashed. But there's no reason why the dog walkers can, still couldn't go up there to use the property. Um, so that's the layout. Uh, ideas that I have. Do you have any questions on the layout per se at this Russ, point? Any questions? Yeah, yeah actually I did. Uh, just one, Russ. The, as you were describing the layout, um, my first reaction was using the quad was a great idea. It just gets people up and they see the buildings and they're circulating. And then my second reaction was a question why you wouldn't use the front lawn, which would be down closer to the parking. And there, where, where I the reason I'm even asked, there's two reasons I'm asking. Number one, you're probably, we'll probably have to do a pretty thorough cleaning of the quad. When you talk about dog walkers, the intensity of dog walking in the quad will probably call for some pretty, pretty good cleaning to make sure that that's good, clean land for people to be on. But the other reason was if you, if you go inside the quad, in the middle of the quad, is the is the mess is the dining areas that they had, and so if if I followed you correctly, where you were going up into the northeast corner for the children's stuff, I think that's up near where the labyrinth is, or the maze. Yes. yes. Is. And then the southwest corner is all the way down on the other side of those dining buildings. So in the middle, it's it's not maybe maybe you want it that way. That's fine. It just struck me that those are some awfully big buildings that are an obstacle in the center of that overall quad. And I wondered whether it wouldn't be better to do the, uh, the, all the booths on the front lawn, which would actually be closer to the parking that you want, but it would be, you wouldn't be, it, you wouldn't be interfering, you know, the buildings wouldn't interfere with the flow, so. Yeah, well, the, the, as I walked around that front grass, I don't think it would be big enough to handle the whole event. Okay. Um, and there's no intent for people to walk from the kids area uh, through the middle of the quad area through the buildings. Uh, the plan is that they would walk always on the paved area uh, okay. on the circumference. And I don't think it's a, gonna be attractive at all for people mm -hmm. to wanna cut through. Now, w will there be people cutting through? You know, possibly. Mm -hmm. um, but okay. uh, there's also a big difference between people who use the kids area uh, and, uh, and the rest of the event. Typically at the Montrose School, the people who went to the kids area pretty much stayed at the kids area. But mm. so I think it's best to be up at the quad. We've got the nice paved area for people to walk. Uh, it's, and it's nice, nicely uh, uh, laned uh, mm. as such so that we can have the people be spaced out 
again for social distancing you know should should they, mm -hmm. they need it okay the, the only other editorial point i would make is that i wouldn't depending on what you want i would not rule out the idea that we would just basically not allow dog walking on that day at all uh, although I, I guess people, I'm trying to remember during me, normal Medfield days, I guess people bring their dogs. Yeah, there are people who, who do bring them and, and it doesn't bother us okay. uh, to have them. And I wouldn't want to necessarily have the dog walkers not be allowed to use the rest of the campus, basically. Yeah. They yeah. may not come into the quad area, but they may have right. all the other areas to use. And I wouldn't want to. That, that's what I was getting at is that. Yeah, you know, I wouldn't rule that out as a possibility if there was a reason why you wanted not to have people, even with dogs on leashes, going through the quad where this is all happening. Um, but it, I'm not recommending it. I'm just. Yeah, and I'm OK that. with it, but I just like to have them have to park up front like yeah, everybody okay. else. OK. Um, we we definitely are working with the so this whole concept of COVID and, and compliance and all and which state which phase we're in and what we will be on September 26th and whether or not there'll be a second wave or not. So I've talked with Nancy Benati over at the Board of Health and she and uh, to let them know what the plan is that I was going to go before you today to uh, seek permission. And so she and um, uh, Bridget, I think it is the agent, uh, are going to work with me on uh, what ideas they have as far as what kind of compliance we will need at that particular time and, and, and such, uh, you know, because of the food court, you know, obviously, and then other issues about social distancing and, and whatnot. So we are working with them uh, right up through through the event uh and if if perchance we get pulled because of you know the state you know pulling us well then medfield day won't happen this year we we don't have a contingency for another date a rain date so to speak those have never worked in the past uh, people don't save two dates uh in in their lives and the rides we couldn't reserve you know two 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 dates for rides so rain dates or now I'm going to call it a COVID date. Uh, wouldn't wouldn't work. Um, uh, may I just jump in with yeah, one, yeah. two things here? Absolutely, uh, go ahead. So one is I think on the layout and everything else on the campus, you should work that out with the buildings and grounds committee, who may have some thoughts and ideas. And you know I I, I think this is a great idea. I'm all in favor of it. But just work out with them. You know I, I don't have any opinion about where anything goes they might but um if you could work that out with them that would be great the second thing would be just would to coordinate John thompson yes it is yeah yep would be to coordinate with parks and rec um there is soccer on saturday mornings typically now who knows if that will be true um in in covid land in the fall um the uh, mccarthy park on saturday mornings in the fall is a madhouse um and so you'll want to coordinate with them. There, there won't be any parking over there, at least until that has cleared out. I, th I think the two events can probably peaceably coexist, um, but there will need to be some coordination because there is not enough parking for people, for multiple sessions worth of cars between the baseball and the soccer at McCarthy to accumulate. And so the successful operation of a Saturday morning at McCarthy Park depends upon the turnover of the people with the eight o'clock games leaving before the people with the 915 games come back. And so it will be a problem if people stay there for midfield day parking. And so that'll need to be sorted out as well, whether you know, again, if there, obviously if there's no soccer or baseball there this fall, which would be a shame, it's not a problem, but you will want to coordinate with them because that is, you know, until about 11 o'clock in the mornings on Saturday, um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's quite a scene there. So um, you want to make sure you're, you're not adding to it or it's not interfering with what you're doing. So other than that, I think it's a great idea. So you're saying that my thought of the overflow across the street would may not be possible because of those those sporting events. Not until after they're over. I mean, yeah. generally speaking, there most of the action is done by noon. There yeah. may be some sporting events. If, again, everybody's season and schedule is being pushed back, so uh, that may not be an option for the whole 
day. Yeah, I'll um, talk to them. So, yeah. But the good news is there really is plenty of land up at the state hospital and there are probably plenty of other places to park cars. I was actually walking the grounds and I was thinking, gee, this would be a nice place to have Medfield Day after all, every, every year. But uh, mm -hmm. um, although it, it, the negative part about having it up there, unfortunately, is well, the advantage of having it downtown is more people can walk to the event who live in the downtown area. <coughs> and, you know, there are the, the restaurants who participate in the food court don't have as far to go if they're just going from Meeting House Pond to you know, Royal Pizza or Noon Hill or, or whatever uh, to get more food or whatnot. So it's a little bit of an inconvenience for them. Oh, the other advantage uh, for having it up in, in, the, um, in the quad is there's enough space to have between booths that I can allow the, the exhibitors to actually park their vehicles Bet either between or behind their, their booths. So they'll be able to drive to the booth area, unload, park there, and then load up again at the end of the day. So that'll be an advantage to all the exhibitors and lessen you know, the parking requirements uh, uh, up front. Um, So that was that. And then two other items in my letter talk about uh, historically, we have a need a, co a, a common victualers license, which I've, I, I had submitted with the, uh, my letter. Uh, so there's the, you know, the, the need for that approval. And as I said in there, there's, you know, you've typically waived the $50 fee um, that you might charge with that. But if you choose not to waive it, that, that, that's fine. And then the second aspect is, um, is the banner. We always ask for permission at, that, at this time to have our banner up there for the benefit of the, uh, the, the, the townspeople so that they know about the, this huge Medfield town event that happens every year. I, under, I know we don't have a bucket truck available in the town. So Memo has, has uh, an electrician uh, friend of ours who has helped us with lighting over at Baxter Park. And he has a bucket truck himself, which he used uh, the past couple of years for helping us with the lights. And so my proposal is that uh, we have the bucket truck already available to us. And Chief Carrico is, 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 is uh, if he wants to participate in the hanging of it, uh, he's welcome to, or we could just make the arrangements ourselves. And then also in consideration uh, for the town uh, allowing us to do this, we would make the uh, bucket truck available to the town whenever the town has a need for a bucket truck, whether it be hanging its own banners, like for instance, town meeting banner, or if you decide to do another banner that you've done before for, um, the school sports teams that won championships uh, or for whatever, uh, or if you had any other uh, needs for it, uh, uh, you know, throughout the town year, we would, uh, you know, make, make the, uh, the bucket truck available uh, uh, to you for that uh, in cooperation. So, so first, yep, go ahead. No, no, I was wrapping up. Okay, so first about the, uh, the site up at the state hospital, um, I, th I think that could be a very good site for uh, Medfield Day. Um, we've just leased out part of what you're planning on using. And so you're gonna have to get permission from the Cultural Alliance of Medfield for uh, what you're talking about as well, because they're in control of uh, the lawn in front of the Lee Chapel now and the, and the parking on the other side of the Lee Chapel. Okay, great, I'll talk with Gene. My thought for that was, not to interrupt your thought there, but I am, sorry. Uh, is uh, that I would also mention to Jean that she may want to have the chapel or whatever open um, for walkthroughs or whatever as part of their quote booth uh, for the day. Um, yeah, so now I'll make sure I talk with Jean as well. 
Yep, and and I think that Mike's uh, suggestion was a good one to talk to John Thompson and his yep. group. I would I would also go to the police and and talk to the chief about uh, about all your plans too, and make sure. And the Absolutely. board of health obviously is uh, important. So most definitely, I I plan on talking with uh, both both chiefs, fire and police, so and Russ, and, and uh, the highway department. Russ, when you go to the Medfield State Hospital Building and Grounds Committee. It's John Thompson, myself, the police chief, the fire chief, and the DPW director. So you can hit us all in one day. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Anything else for Russ? Russ, you want to talk about the concert? Yes. So as you know, we-, we... But Before we do that, do we need motions on any of these things or approvals? Um, I think you need to go to the building and grounds committee first to make sure it's gonna fit in. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, I'm going to need to move fast on this because I have to start <clears throat> letting my exhibitors know the change of uh, course here. Um, well, I think I we, think you've got a yes pending the specifics. Yeah. I think that's the general sense uh, that there's details that you should and steps that you should go through uh, to make sure that everybody's on board. But I okay. think the selectmen are telling you that, that they're pretty much okay. So we're All waiting right. to hear back from our the people that the run the different us, departments. It means the rest of us have to figure out how to make it work for us. Okay. Um, can I get on the next agenda then? Will I need to uh, present again? No. No. Next agenda is Saturday morning. No, not that one. <laughs> uh, but... <clears throat> Do I need to present again in order to get you let you know, communicate to you that I've dealt with all these people and we're okay and on board with everybody? I think we certainly want to hear back from from the different groups. Yep, and whether it's through you or through them, doesn't and how matter. Can I, how do I communicate that to you short of coming to another selectmen's meeting? <clears throat> I can I can handle that. Yep. Okay. All right. That's great. Okay, that's great. So I will do that at ASAP. Okay, and then about the concerts? So we were all very disappointed that we really needed to decide early on whether it was going to happen or not. And with the economic issues, uh, in not only the COVID issues with social distancing and whether, you know, which week we might be able to have a concert and all that, the economics was that you know, our, our, our sponsors that, you know, get us through the economics of it were hard hit themselves. And so we weren't getting the economic support. So unfortunately had to be canceled, but we sort of mulled this over and we figure, figured that maybe we could have one concert um, and it'd be the Stacy Peasley, the so-called kids, uh, kids uh, band which if you've been to the concerts, it's, it's very nice music. I, I enjoy it as an adult, uh, but it's, it is focused on the kids. And it's a small band and uh, uh, she's agreed to work with us at a, uh, um, at a bit of a discounted rate and a, sh a little shorter time uh, frame. And uh, we, we were gonna have just a, uh, a virtual concert with her and just have it streaming online and then we decided, you know what, maybe we can open it up. We figured by July, we would be able to, to have it. So, um, you know, we talked with, you know, the various town people and uh, got, got, you know, kind of permission that yes, that does fall within something that we can do. And so the idea there is to have it uh, again up at the hospital um, and whether or not we have it up on the uh, quad, not quite sure, um, or if we have it up on that grassy area that uh, uh, you guys uh, had, uh, was it, I forget which one of you had mentioned, um, but that grassy area up, up towards the front might be good enough for, uh, for, for, for that activity. We would have to bring a couple of portable generators. We would probably have to bring one or two porta potties um, because there's no other facilities uh, there. 
and uh, you know, a washing, maybe even a hand washing sta station. So it's a little bit more complicated than uh, we would we would be at the gazebo. But again, the open space there would allow us to have uh, the social distancing. And again, we would be working with the Board of Health to make sure that uh, we're in compliance and what other issues they might see. I wouldn't need a banner for like we normally put the banner up for the summer concerts during this, that season. We wouldn't need a banner for this one shot deal. Uh, there'd be no road closings. We wouldn't have to limit, you know, other public parking like we would do for Medfield Day. We wouldn't have to limit the dog walkers uh, because I think they'll stay away from, you know, the band and yeah. And then the idea being that, would we be able to have more, you know, would we want to have more concerts? We don't know at this point. We'll, we may just kind of see how it goes and, and then maybe play it by ear and maybe come to you one more time in August, but we're not planning on having a series there. Right now it's just a one-off. Questions, Gus? Uh, no. No, I, I think first I'm glad you're you're trying to do this for us. It's uh, I think it's a good thing given that uh, given all the disruptions and everything's harder to do. I appreciate the effort on this, but uh, it's it's a good place to be. Uh, you know, ultimately we just signed a chapel lease for Culture and Arts Center, and uh, the the vision here is that property at one some point here is going to become a venue for both indoor and outdoor performances. So it seems to me that this would be a good thing to. If it can be pulled off, this would be a good thing to get started up there. And we haven't, set, I'm sorry, we haven't settled on a date yet, as my letter says. We're looking at either July 9th or 16th. So we'd be asking for, you know, the option of either day. I think um, I actually met with the Board of Health agent today, Russ, and given that this is definitely a phase three activity, and the governor has said that phase three is definitely not starting before July 6th, I think we should go with the 16th date. Okay. Better date. Okay. Mike, do you have any questions or comments? Uh, no, uh, it sounds great to me. Okay, I agree. It sounds like a great idea for the town. Thanks for doing it. And uh, I think you just need to coordinate with the Board of Health to make sure that they think that it's okay. And again, I would talk to John Thompson when you talk to him about Medfield Day. I think the, the that uh, lawn in front is, is sort of a natural natural amphitheater that might be a great place for you to look at for your concerts. Okay, Hello. so do I need to talk with those two? Well, I've been talking with the Board of Health, but I have to talk with John Thompson before you guys approve it. No, I think I think the selectmen are approving it, but we're going to need to just talk about logistics with John. Okay, so 16. Okay, so this letter will be signed tonight, and then I'll just follow up with John, or do I follow up with John first and then communicate that to you? Like, like Medfield Day. I, I would be fine with signing the letter and then talk to John. I think it's a much smaller event than. Okay, than, great. So that would be helpful. That, that works. That works for me. I, I would think the only issue that we have actually with either of these around coordination is that if some some major glitch that none of us anticipated came up as you talk with people that made something you had in mind so completely unacceptable that you had to completely rethink it, that's, that's the only uh, situation where we haven't actually given you an okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, for me, that's the Board of Health, that they need to say that this is a, a, a safe thing for the town to be doing. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, I appreciate you guys giving me the time and, uh, and the thoughts also involved that I hadn't thought about. Thanks Thank for you, putting Russ. some things on for the town. Yeah, thank you, Ross, for, for making all this happen. I, I will say that there will be some disappointed people in my house household if the bouncy things are, are missing this year. From uh, although it will save me a substantial amount of money. So. Uh, well, hopefully there'll be some other fun items that, that they might enjoy. I mean, um, you also have to buy tickets for it, probably, but that's all right. 
we, we are to going it. to have the train. Okay. But, uh, Thanks, Russ. Thank you, Russ. Well, Russ. Russ didn't mention the sea dew rides on the Charles River or down down at the kayak. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, Chris. What did you want to do next? Uh, let's go to COVID updates. I just have two minor. Well. One major thing, one minor thing to talk about. Just as a reminder, the last Sunday at the Medfield Transfer Station is this Sunday. And then I had a long talk uh, with Nancy Irwin today. And unfortunately, um, the swap is not going to be able to open this year. Oh, boy. Um, you know, they've been trying uh, for the last month or so to come up with the ways in which we could open it. Um, and it's just not possible this year. And they've started to receive a lot of questions um, people are asking when they were going to open. So they wanted to make an announcement. So I told them I would announce tonight that it's not going to open for the season. Um, and we hope to see them back next year. They are working on some alternative plans, um, that may not involve the town. So I'll let them handle the PR on that. Um, but we won't be able to open this year, unfortunately. Okay. That's too bad. I know. Then under action items, Chief Carrico requests the Board of Selectmen vote to sign the application for the Coronavirus Emergency Supplemental Funding Program. Yes, this is a grant the Chief is applying for. It just came out this week. Um, I believe the Police Chief is working on uh, her version of it as well. And what it's covering is future costs um, in case we have another issue. As you know, we currently um, staff the paramedics with two medics and an EMT during the um, during the COVID pandemic, when things were uh, right at the beginning, we always filled the third shift where normally we wouldn't fill that third slot, um, but we did fill it during the emergency. We've been able to back off of that now and we've dropped down to two shifts uh, if somebody calls in sick or has a vacation. Uh, this grant would allow us to fill that third shift with overtime uh, if we have an increase or we see a need to have that happening. So it's a, a grant for $43,000. Christine, how do these, I'm just trying to get straight in my head, there's, there's potential FEMA aid, there's CARES, which now there's can't care. duplicate FEMA, and now this is a grant, so would this grant be something that might displace CARES funding, or how, how do they all relate? If we receive this grant funding, then we would not put the overtime for the fire department through any additional FEMA or CARES money. Um, it's becoming incredibly hard for the accounting department and for Donna Semino to manage the different sources of funding. And Sarah will talk about our complete um, our streets program as well. So there's multiple projects going on. It would be nice if they just gave us the money as local aid. Uh, it would be much right. more helpful to Medfield, but um, you know we'll take I mean, the opportunity. The, the CARES amount or what, 1.13 1 million or whatever it is, it's like, that's good. That's a good number, except that it really seems like the hoops that you have to go through to get it as a practical matter, not that we won't get anything out of it, but it seemed like a big number when it was announced, but it actually seems as a practical matter, that might be a relatively minor source of funding for us. Well, I think given, I, you know, I talked to Jeff earlier today and given what's gonna be required to open the schools for the fall, mm -hmm. um, will significantly we'll use, that. Okay. Uh, use okay. that one. Yeah. Okay. And we should be getting guidance on that this week. Okay. Um, so I just need a vote to authorize the chair if you're okay with the grant. Could we get that motion then please? I will move that we authorize the chair to sign the application for the Coronavirus Emergency Supplemental Funding Program. Second. Mr. Peterson. Yep. Mr. Murby. Okie dokie. <laughs> and Mr. Marcucci, yes. Oh, okay. And now I am promoting um, Assistant Town Clerk Marion Binaldi to discuss the Board of Registrar resignation and your appointment. Hi, Marion. Hi, Marion. Thanks for coming. Hi, everybody. Hey, Marion. Hi. So I, um, Jim Mullen, submitted to you via letter, which I believe you have a copy of. We do. Um, that Mr. Holinsky um, is resigning from our Board of Registrar because he has moved out of town. So we wanted to accept his resignation and Jim also submitted a letter stating his recommendation for appointment to the Board of Registrar, which is Donna Young, who's here in Medfield um, and she's 
looking for a way to serve in the community and this seemed to be the best fit for her. So would love to have her board on the board of registrar. So that's where we're at. It would be a three year term. Any questions, Gus? Nope. Mike? Uh, no. Both appreciate uh, Lee's service and appreciate Donna's willingness to jump right in. Yep, me too. Um, I guess one of the things that I would comment on is that it's, I think it's nice if we have openings on town boards to give any, everybody in town an opportunity to, to volunteer. Um, so I think that that would be a, a nice way to do it. Uh, but if she's interested and, uh, and willing, that's good. I'm happy to have her serve. Yeah, I agree with you. I think Jim's attitude about this was with all of the elections that are coming up and early voting that is coming up with these big elections in September and November, we kind of wanted to get the seat filled as quickly as possible. Um, so when we're done expressed interest, that's how it kind of came about. It was more of a, we need to kind of get this going. We're already yep. knee deep in petitions and things of that nature for the state primary in September and early voting and things like that. So we kind of wanted to get everybody on board quick. Yep, thanks for doing it. Uh, so do we have a uh, motion then to accept yes, Lee's I, resignation with regrets and to appoint Donna Young? I move that we accept uh, Lee's resignation and move to appoint Donna Young as a registrar for a three-year term. Second. Mr. Peterson. Yep. Mr. Murby. Aye. <laughs> Mr. Marcucci, yes. Thank you. Thanks, Marion. Thanks, Marion. So the next two items are Mogulay items. And then uh, the, after that, so we're done with those, I guess. Yeah, we're done with Mo. We're going to hold census till the next meeting. And you already approved uh, the grant yep. program. Uh, and so the, go ahead. Sorry. It's fine. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Joy Ricciuto, the town accountant, requests the Board of Selectmen vote to sign a one-year engagement with Powers and Sullivan for the fiscal year 21 audit. So is this, a, a, are we changing uh, firms? I know that there's always this policy of trying to change firms every several years. So this is, this is our existing firm that we've had, that we've had for uh, since 2007. 2013, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. 2013. We've had them for seven years, sorry. Um, it was actually my intention to change and we went out and sought quotes from other firms um, based on the budgeting. We had not budgeted. We were short uh, roughly $7,000 uh, in terms of the next bid and given uh, what was happening with COVID and my delay and being able to, to review the proposals when they came in, uh, I told Joy that I'd be fine with this recommendation, but I also made a commitment to you that we would look at changing that. So I'm, I'm open to that if, if that is something you would rather do. I, th I think given the, well, go ahead, Gus. I, I'm fine with what you're proposing here. Mike? Yeah, I think it's fine to go with them for another year. I, I think we should, you know, I think this will be seven years or eight years um, with this auditor after this audit. Uh, it's probably better given current circumstances not to change for this year, um, but I think we should plan to change uh, for next year. Um, and just as part of a normal rotation i think seven or eight years is a pretty good pretty good run with one auditing firm and that would give us some time and and to budget what we need to budget and i suspect we probably could get a competitive auditing firm um to come in about the same level as as powers and Sullivan for next year as well so agreed and i think if we uh go out to bid sooner rather than later uh we'll be able to budget for that and give the other firms a chance to actually respond to our bid and get in place Chris, I'm fine uh, to stick in with them. So uh, we need So I would move then. that we um, vote to sign a one year engagement with Powers and Sullivan for the fiscal year 2021 audit. Second. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Mr. Murby. Yes. And Mr. Marcucci. Yes. Our next item is a vote to authorize the town administrator to sign the Massachusetts Shared Streets Grant Program. This is, I just alluded to this a few minutes ago. Um, this is money coming down from the Department of Transportation to help cities and towns do some temporary um, 
assistance with their restaurants. Uh, two of the projects we're looking at is one is the alleyway next to Cutlets. Uh, allowing that on Saturdays to be shut and do some special lighting and some tables to allow them to have some outdoor seating. Um, we're also trying to help with the barriers that are going to be needed um, on Jane's Avenue in order for Nosh and Grog to continue having their outdoor seating. We need to have some separation from the roadway. So Sarah's actually been heading up this grant program and talking to everybody and she'll be sending the grant in. I'm looking for authorization tonight because the grant deadline doesn't line up with our meeting. So we haven't finished the application yet, but we need authorization tonight if that's okay. Any questions or comments, Gus? Nope, Mike? Uh, no comments. I would move that we authorize uh, the town administrator to sign the grant application as requested. Second. Mr. Peterson? Yes. Mr. Murphy? Okay. And Mr. Marcucci? <laughs> yes. And then uh, our next item is Sarah Raposa, town planner, requests the Board of Selectmen approve Medfield Meadows 2020 letter regarding sales prices. Yeah, I'm sorry. Actually, I just realized Sarah's on here. Let me promote Sarah. I should have let her speak for the other one. I'm sorry. Hold on one sec. Now we'll find out if you got it right, Chris. <laughs> There we go. Sorry, Sarah, I spoke for Hi, you. Sarah. That's okay. I was hoping you were going to take this one too, but <laughs> <laughs> um, essentially this ask is on behalf of the developers of Medfield Meadows regarding updating the regulatory agreement that was signed with them to allow for the condos, the um, four, I'm sorry, three affordable condominiums to be sold at the 2020 HUD rate, which um, is, I think was $317,000. 17,100. Okay, yes. And so um, it requires the um, Board of Selectmen to authorize that increase, and then it'll go to DHCD for approval on their end since they're party to the regulatory agreement as well. Um, it seemed like a, a significant increase um, I think it was 280 was the, um, in that neighborhood, was the price that was in the um, regulatory agreement from, I think, based on 2018 numbers. Um, but I did review the numbers with um, Rayco from DHCD, and she agreed that there were, there was potential for uh, qualified buyers in that price range. Questions, comments, Gus? Uh, first off, I don't. I, is there? I have, I don't see any documents, so this is kind of just we're having a conversation here. No, I'm sorry. I thought I sent that over today. Uh, unless I missed one of your. You might have you received a, um, a, a document that had a little table on it, like a little chart that says purchase price limits. Oh well, so. That might be, that's that's my fault then. I didn't send that along. We had a couple of last minute things we were trying to get on the agenda okay. tonight. So you may not have received it. Yeah, the the one I saw at a DHCD, Christine, was the- The, the, the non the, or the, uh, Yes, the, the right of first refusal, the, the non-exercise. Right. I'm sorry. Sarah, I, I apologize. <laughs> I have it on my screen if you wanna allow me to share. Well, I, I don't know if that do would do me any Saturday. good at this point anyway. Um, let me let me go with what you said and then see if I understand it. So basically what's happening is this is a request to increase the purchase price of the affordable units by, it sounds like, if I heard you right, something like $37,000, mm -hmm. yep. which is kind of big, uh, mm -hmm. more than 10% more than of the original price. Does that in turn lead to, who, who benefits from that? Is that just that the overall purchase price that's available to the developer then goes up by that amount on those affordable units and presumably the market rate, because they still, they, he's still bound by the profits limit, right? That's true. Um, it might help you to see this chart. Um, and the profit limit applies to the overall development. Right, yeah. so, and so, yeah, what I, so what, I'm trying to understand if the market rates come down 
with the affordable rates going up? That's, that's really my question. That I don't know. Um, I do know that they based their original regulatory agreement on uh, HUD income limits from 2018, and they've been increased for 2020. So that's why they were looking for the increase. We had a similar issue um, when we had a rental issue. We had to have, we increased the rental amounts. It was a similar thing. That's it. So so the, couldn't remember the name. So the piece of that, that, and I, this is me being difficult. So I, I'm, if, if DHCD is okay with this, and Mike and Peter are okay with this, I'm okay with it. But the the one thought that I have around that is that if incomes have gone up in their latest, I would be willing to bet in a year those incomes are going to go right back down, given what we're dealing with with COVID. So um, I'll uh, make that as an observation. Mr. Chairman, the uh, mortgage rates also f uh, factor into this. So to the extent that they've come down, based on things that are going on, that ends up increasing the price because it's a, it's a total figure that a, a family at 80% of median income, a certain percentage, they figure out what that percentage is and that's what they can afford. So it functions in the financing as well. And because it's such a high percentage financed, even a small interest rate change can have a dramatic effect. And is the rate actually being set by HUD? The interest rate in this pro forma is 3.4%. So it's a sales price of uh, $317,100, a 5% down payment with a $301,000 mortgage. Um, so that's the type of information that's on this chart. Uh, it requires a necessary income of um, $84,197 for a family of four, which is which tracks with um, the range, which is about $100,000 for a family of four um, for our area median income. So, so Sarah, let me try running at it a slightly different way. If I heard you right, DHCD is okay with this change. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this change almost sounds like it's nearly, it, it's a function of the calculations that go into a straight, legitimate, neutral calculation of what an affordable unit should cost. So there's no, there's nothing going on here where a developer is pushing hard and DHCD is saying, well, yeah, I guess that's still within the acceptable range, but it's not that kind of a judgment call. This is almost a straightforward administrative adjustment is what I think I'm hearing. Uh, it's I think so because your, your prices are always gonna um, be based on the current year. So just that they hadn't been constructed and that was what was submitted at the time of application. Um, so I think it makes sense. I want to um, read what Reiko said. If there is a market for buyers between 84,000 and 96,000 who can get the competitive interest rate, then this price would not be too high is what she says. Well, I mean, look, this is, this is what, um, every developer of these properties wants to do, which is to try to sell the affordable units at the absolute peak and maximum of the affordable amount. The same issue is with the rental, where they want to sell at the rental, right? And we, we love these kind of bureaucratic formulas and all of these adjustments and all of these things that we can, you know, median income percentage this, median income percentage that, which, which as you know, I think is absolutely the wrong way to go about this. And is part of the reason why we have such a housing problem is we spend so much time bureaucratizing this stuff and so much time trying to, you know, make judgments about who's deserving, who's not deserving, who gets this, who gets that. So I'm inclined to be a no on this, that I think that developers are going to make enough money off of this. And, um, to the extent we can open up the pool a little bit more uh, of people to whom this is going to be accept accessible by keeping the prices a little bit lower, we should do that. I, I don't think there's any need here. And, and I understand that DHCD is their, their, you know, they want to encourage these developers and I get they want to go along with what these developers want to do and that they're allied with them and all the rest of it. And I, I don't fault them for that given what the constraints that they have been placed on them and the particular philosophy that we've been under for the construction of housing in the Commonwealth for the past 40 years. And that's the judgment we've made and that's what we've done. But I'm a no. I don't think there's any reason to, to agree to this. They agreed at a lower amount. I don't think there's any, you know, manipulation of home prices based on flooding the market with cheaper loans aside, um, the actual amount that people can afford based on what they're making, not just what they can finance, um, is not going up. 
Um, and it's certainly not going up for people who are lower on the income level as opposed to higher. And so the people who are going to be profiting over those government subsidized cheap loans are doing better than the people who are taking out those loans. And so I'd rather the houses go to people. And even if they have to, to borrow a little bit less, that's OK, too. Uh, there's no requirement that we force people to borrow the absolute maximum here to do this and the rest. So I'm a no. So, Mike, so sir, can I can oh, I go ahead? Can I counter this is this is uh, in the interest of the discussion because uh, I'm I'm new I'm neutral on this, but the one point the counterpoint I'd make to your point, Mike, is that um, on one hand we're building affordable housing so that people can afford, you know, be able to afford to move in here, and that's that's a good thing. And it sounds like this adjustment still fits within the target range of what people who should get affordable housing should get. The affordable units in a development like this are affordable because the reduced price that the builder, the developer accepts from the affordable units is added on to the market rate units. Uh, and given that, the mar given that the developer is constrained on how much money the developer can make. So in other words, if this, I'm, a, I'm making an assumption here that this adjustment does not create a windfall for the developer. What it does is it, it brings the market rate unit prices down so that people aren't paying a premium above and beyond what they might otherwise pay for those market rate units. So to the extent that that, that subsidy is a smaller, smaller distance because the people that buy the market rate units are the ones who absorb that subsidy, I can see an argument for going along with this so long as it's not a windfall to the developer. So I am. I'm not, I'm not hard just, up either way. Just, just a couple of points. The market rate are going to sell for what the market is. And presumably the developer is going to sell them for the highest price possible. All right. Um, the reality of this, and you know, I don't know what the statistics are on how tightly um, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts regulates that 20% profit, how often actions are brought against developers who violate the 20% profit rule and how heavily that's investigated. It may well be um, that our attorney general's office and the other people who are responsible for doing this investigate very heavily these developments and really make sure that the developers are capped at 20% and spend a lot of their time making sure that they don't exceed that 20%. So I'm not going to make any comment whatsoever on how often that happens. Um, I will say in this particular instance, I don't think we can ignore the fact that the construction company that is building this development is affiliated with the owner of the development. And so, you know, a little bit like, um, you know, when, when you see professional sports teams and how much they make and they have an expense to for the parking garage and it turns out, well, the owner also owns the parking garage. Um, and so, yeah, the, what, which bucket that goes into, I think it would be more of a challenge to audit that here because obviously construction is an allowable expense and whatever profit is made on the construction probably does not count into that 20% requirement. I'm happy to be corrected if I'm wrong. So, and this is not to cast aspersions on anybody. I think the developers are operating within the rules that have been set allegedly um, by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, and every developer and every other business person is entitled to operate within those rules and to try to make the best profit they can according to the rules that have been set by the government and have been set by the commonwealth and we are one of those bodies setting the rules and i think in setting this particular rule i don't see any reason to increase this to the maximum price and i don't think it should be our goal to say that we want to sell, have the affordable units being sold to the people at the absolute tip top of the range of what counts as affordable and that to the extent we can make it available to a broader group of people by keeping the prices lower, that's what I would like to see. I think, so we, sir, I think we refer this to Chairman Solomon. So sir, Sarah and Chris, my question has to do with whether the, uh, the, the figuring of this price is a, just merely a, a ministerial application of the HUD rules or whether the developer is exercising some discretion and, and if, in fact, the developer is exercising some discretion in this, then I'm, I'm, I'm sort of inclined to agree with Mike that there's not much benefit for the town in, in going along with it. But I, I don't know how these prices are determined. So that's my yeah, question. There's, there, there's no discretion. Um, but as Mike said, it's based on a formula. They originally, when they submitted their information to you, used 2018 
information, they'd like to use 2020 information, which raises the rate. Um, and I would say that maybe you put a pin in this and have the developer come and uh, talk to you directly. I'm just the messenger. So mm -hmm. this is I mean, I'll, I'll say unless we're required by the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to agree to this, then I don't I don't agree to it. So no, I think they, they can come if they want and, and make I'm their not case. Sure if you're not agreeing with it based we, on the information that I'm presenting. Um, where the, I think that if you're going to say no, then they should be able to present their own information, their own request. I should sure. be presenting that. If that's what they want to do, if they want to make a, a request, but it sounds to me like the request is based on the fact that the formula allows them to charge more, which I don't blame them for. This is not a, I'm not criticizing the developer. The formula allows them to raise it. I, I didn't think the formula required them to try to sell it at the maximum amount. If the formula requires, if they're required by law to sell at the maximum amount, then yeah. we why, why even ask us if we're required by law to agree? Why do we even sign, have to sign off if we're required by law to do it? Mark, so, do you know the answer to the question? Well, sort of. Uh, the cap, the overall cap on the profit is 20 percent. Uh, to, to Mike's earlier point, the, the Commonwealth has not done a particularly great job mm -hmm. aggressively auditing or uh, enforcing that limit. The Inspector General, going way back to Greg Sullivan, uh, did a massive investigation which showed a, a pretty much a total failure to enforce it, and that was a number of years ago. But at any rate, the developers maxed out at 20%, but they're not necessarily, in a particular project, going to hit that 20%. So they're doing everything they can to get that. If it were to exceed 20% as a result of an audit, hypothetically, the proceeds are supposed to come to the community uh, to go into creation of more affordable housing. So they don't get to keep anything in excess of 20%. But I know of very few projects that have actually come in as an excess. So as a matter of course, Mark, we should probably be asking for an audit on any 40B in town then. It's the state that does the audit. You can ask all you want. Oh. But it's their determination to do the audit. They're supposed to do it. But again, uh, you've got uh, hypothetical and reality. Mm -hmm. hey, hey, Mark, is just one other question on this. Is, is, the, is the practice of coming up with this initial estimate, in this case using 2018 numbers, is it just common practice that that is a pro forma estimate that's made early in the process because it has to be, and that almost as a routine practice, developers will then update that estimate to, to map onto the information for the year that the, the development's actually coming online. I mean, you can't, you don't know what that information is going to be when you first put things together. I've just, are well, we looking at it? gone both ways in the past. So uh, presumably, if they can sell them for more, they're going to come in. Uh, if, so they, if, it, if, if they, somehow or other we're already authorized to sell for, for more and it dropped down. Got it. Uh, if you've got somebody aggressive overseeing your, your administration of your housing, they may pick it up and, and basically say, no, you've got to set a lower rate. But Okay, so, so it's not routine. It's not just a standard routine adjustment that gets made that we're turning into a big issue. It, it's you know, it's, it's a combination of everything that's been said, and it, it certainly is a factor of uh, what's the most that they, they can be authorized to uh, uh, okay. to sell it. Had you know, uh, but again, at least hypothetically, had it dropped, had the market gone the other way because interest rates went up or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the maximum price was lower. Uh, presumably that would have been taken into account too. So it's just getting current as they're getting ready to market, particularly with a project that's taken a while to come online. Mm -hmm. That sounds reasonable. Let the developer come in and. I think so. That. Yeah, that's my suggestion too. So why don't we let uh, Mr. Kelly come in if he wants to talk to us about it? We'll let him know. Okay, very good. Uh, Chris, next thing is authorized town administrator to sign a letter to DHCD regarding for John Crowder Road. John Crowder Road. So this home is in the Allendale subdivision. Um, and the Gilmers, who were one of the original recipients of the home, have decided to move. Um, they raised their family there. 
Um, and now their daughter has built a house in a neighboring town and they are going to move in with her. Um, so DHCD has set the purchase price at 282,920, which is based mm. on the formula in the deed rider. Um, and we are going to, it's a three bedroom, two bathroom home. And we're going to have a lottery if you agree that we don't want to purchase the home ourselves, which I would not recommend at this point. Does that, does the lottery favor Bedfield people? Uh, so we can apply for preference, but usually on a resale preference is not considered. Uh, it was when the initial lottery was done, but yeah, we, okay. we can ask for it. Um, there will be a preference for uh, families since it's a three bedroom and we haven't had a three bedroom come up in Allendale in a while. Um, it's probably been a good 10 years. So uh, we expect, in fact, I already started to get some calls today. So we expect uh, an incredible amount of interest in this home. And there's no, there's no provision for a preference for town people that work here in town, town employees or thing. I, I'm reacting to some other conversations I've heard about people saying we should have more town employees live here. There's not no way the, to. Yeah, not on the resale. We did when we first sold them uh, approximately 30 years ago. <laughs> Okay. Well, it sounds Gus, like we could buy it and then we could have it as a townhouse to we'll rent see. to sell to a town employee we'll sell it or to something. whoever we want. <laughs> yeah. If this meeting goes any longer, I might need it. <laughs> okay. So based on what you said, Chris, it sounds like there's some two bedroom houses at that development, Allendale then, are there? Yes, there's it's a mix of two and three bedrooms. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> any more questions about this? Uh, I would move that we uh, authorize the town minister to sign a letter declining uh, to exercise our right of first refusal on Four John Crowder Drive. Second. Excuse me, Four John Crowder Road. Second. As Mr. Peterson. Yes. Mr. Murphy. Aye. And Mr. Marcucci, aye. Uh, let's see. Our next item is uh, authorized chairman to sign letter to. Division of Local Services regarding deficit spending related to COVID-19. So as we talked earlier, uh, the DOR is allowing us to have deficits, uh, which will not impact free cash as all the cities and towns wait for the CARES and FEMA money to be reimbursed. We don't anticipate um, any large deficits and we actually in anticipate some money coming in tomorrow, but just in case where we're not meeting again uh, until after town meeting, we need to have this in place uh, just in case it did happen. So this is so, Christine. This is these would be deficits that we are incurring for clear COVID nineteen expenses, which we have every reason to believe we will be reimbursed for. Correct. Okay. So I would move that we authorize the chairman to sign the letter to DLS regarding deficit spending related to COVID nineteen as requested. Second, Mr. Peterson. Yes, Mr. Murphy. Let's do it. <laughs> Mr. Marcucci, okay. Um, these, are just count, these are just recorded as three nothing votes, right, Christine? Oh, sure. No, no, they have to be recorded correctly. <laughs> I believe the last time I did try to do a three nothing, I was corrected, so it will be reflected. All right. Um, and then you talked, we talked about the West Street 27 earmark, but I need yeah. you to authorize me to sign it. So I would move that we vote to accept the budget earmark for West Street Route 27 study and authorize the town administrator to sign the state contract for said earmark. Second. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Mr. Murphy. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Marcucci. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, fiscal year 2021 operating and capital budget. Anything on that, Chris? I don't have anything on that tonight. I do, however, oh. sorry. Oh, great. I will say, I will say, Nick, that uh, my kids will be very excited because they always say, "How come Nick Milano? He, look, he looks so good in that tie, and he doesn't talk." <laughs> so the Marcucci children will be very happy that you're talking, especially if they're still allowed to be up here at night at eight fifty-five. Well, I, hello to the Marcucci family. But um, <laughs> the, just so you are aware that we are preparing a one twelve budget in case of any issues um, on Saturday or Monday. And if something does happen, we will have to have a meeting next mm. week to have um, you review and approve the 112 budget. We've requested all the department heads to give us where they expect expenses to be in July. Uh, typically, we have a lot of um, payments in July of large expenses for the course of the year. So we've been collecting those just to prepare it as a precautionary measure only, but just wanted to flag that for you folks so you were um, so, not so caught up next week. 
I've asked this question, I think, of Christine before when I was initially thinking we weren't going to have a town meeting. If, in fact, the, the legislation specifies we can't approve less than one twelfth, and my question was, do we have any large expenses in the front part of the year that would suggest we should approve more than one twelfth? So, yes, we do. I think that's in the that's in the realm of possibility if that becomes necessary. Correct. We pay a number of contracts up front for the course of the fiscal year. I mean, we have a three million dollar bill for the Norfolk County Retirement System, and there are several others. So it would certainly be more than one twelfth, but it would be a lot of payments okay. for the entire okay. fiscal year. Okay. And the next thing is the uh, 2020 annual town meeting and warrant articles. And I think those are all set. I think we're all set. That's probably the last night you're going to see the 2020 agenda items on there. Um, I just have a couple of things related to that. Uh, the 2020 town meeting website has been updated with logistics. There is a picture of the field map of what it'll look like when you get there. Um, if anybody has any questions or concerns about how town meetings going to operate or logistics, please email me or give me a call. Um, we're actually doing our last site visit on Thursday to do a walkthrough. Um, I will tell you, after planning an outdoor wedding like this, I now understand why my parents refused to entertain my plan for an outdoor wedding. Um, and they are not wrong. <laughs> I will call and apologize to my father this evening. Um, other than that, you're going to meet at 1030 on Saturday. Um, and we're ready to go. I only had one question on the diagram, Christine. What are delay speakers? So when you have, uh, Chris Allen explained this to me, when you have a venue like that, you have to put speakers um, halfway back so that everybody gets the sound at the same time. Uh, okay. Yeah. Got it. So wh where are the selectmen meeting? We're going to meet right on the field. We, we have special seating, Mark. I'll, I'll go over it with you when I call you tomorrow. Okay. We're all at individual desks. Um, and I, I, Christine, I would just say if, apart from the logistics, if people haven't, and Gus had offered uh, last week, if anyone who was not gonna be able to make it to the meeting for whatever reason had a position they wanted to be stated, he offered that he would convey those that position mm -hmm. um, at the meeting. And I would say to, you know, to the extent that people have any questions about any of the warrant articles, any of the budget items, um, anything that's come up, I would say I'm sure you could email any of us, um, Gus, Peter, myself, or Christine, or Nick. Um, and we have a town meeting page. And I think if we do get questions, um, assuming they're not, not of a confidential variety, I mean, maybe we can just sort of post any questions we get with the answers yeah. up to the town meeting uh, page, kind of as, as they come in, if people have, you know, want to know about this line item or that line item, or what, what's this about, we could respond to the email and then sort of just put up without identifying who asked the question, here's a question that came in just so um, that information gets out there and people I don't want anyone on Saturday either for health concerns or because of the heat or what to feel reticent to ask a question. I mean, obviously we're going to have a town meeting. It's going to be a real town meeting. I think that the moderator has made it clear that he'd like it to be as efficient as possible um, so that everybody's safe and that um, it's not, but, but it's still going to be a town meeting. And so to the extent people have questions, email one of us, our email addresses are all on the website, email Christine or Nick. And then if, if those questions come in, we can post, and I know we're going to put some info sheets together and whatnot, but we'll be posting things as well on the uh, on that FAQ page or on the town meeting page, um, so um, other people can get the benefit of that. I'll actually I will add everybody's email address onto that town meeting page. So they just have right. to go to one spot to do that. Right. Um, right. And if you look, there is a listing of all the warrant articles and any background material or anything that we've done along the way for people who want to get more educated about a specific warrant article more than we could put in the full warrant mm -hmm. report. I saw that. I thought that we've we've been doing that for the last several town meetings. I think it's a great way to do it um, for people who want to read into it more. But but please email us, email Christine or Nick, and and we'll answer your questions and and make it available um, in advance of Saturday. Great. That's all I have for this evening. Okay. Uh, any selectman reports, Gus? Uh, just one minor update. We did have the uh, development committee meeting last uh, Wednesday and is probably one of the major things was to talk about the chapel lease. I was, I, I wanted to make sure that we didn't make a decision on the lease here. And then I'd go to the development committee and find that we'd 
driven a stake through the heart of the development potential of the site or something like that. But actually the development committee, if anything, thought that the idea that the uh, that something would be going on with the chapel even before any development occurred with the rest of the campus was as likely to be an ad advantage for us in the sense that it probably conveys a bit more credibility about the viability of the site for developers looking at it. So uh, none, of, none of the members of the committee had any reservations about that. Uh, one administrative point, Ken Richard is, uh, has uh, apparently has already sold his house. He's a member of the committee. Uh, he was a member of the State Hospital Advisory Committee when, when I was on it and started with the uh, Strategic Planning Committee. Uh, Ken announced that they're going to, he and his wife will be moving out of town to a house they're buying in Falmouth. Uh, but he also, but he expressed a willingness to continue on as a member of the committee. Uh, so uh, certainly I think the selectmen have it within their purview to interject if you want to, but my recommendation would be that that decision be left up to the committee members themselves. Uh, and as far as that goes, I'm more interested in hearing uh, Todd's and Johnny's view. I, personally, I, I would think it would be great if, Ken, if Ken's willing to do it. It's great to have him on. We're trying to find two more members of the committee. So all the more reason to keep someone on with the corporate knowledge. But uh, that's just an update right now. My, my suggestion to the two of you would be that we let the development committee make that decision on their own on whether to allow someone who technically won't be living in town stay on the committee. And that's it. Okay. Uh, Chris, is there any issue with uh, someone from who's not a town resident being a voting member? Would they just be official, ex officio instead? Or I have to look. I think there are several voting members on the Medfield Energy Committee that don't live in town. We've had, um, we've had some as ex officio, so I'd, ha I'd have to look. But you do have yeah. some out of town on your committees. Yep. Okay. I Mike? I, I think it would be great if he stayed. He obviously brings a lot of experience and, and knowledge and expertise to the table. So we still need more members. So if, if anybody's still watching we and you have some real estate uh, experience and knowledge, we still do need some people to join that committee. And, and that's you know, that's an important issue for the town and a real, real place to make a difference. And what's going to be one of the major decisions we have to make over the next couple of years. Committee does have resumes in, uh, and I, th I think our meeting in July is when we'll tackle the, the selection Great. of those people. Great. That's all I had. Okay, anything else, Mike? The only thing is if we can put on our agenda for the next, next time we meet after Saturday, we have two vacancies on the Affordable Housing Trust Board of Trustees. Uh, we do, I think we only have two, inter two interested people um, who have stepped forward. And so um, the trust board is taking July and August off for now, unless something comes up that requires a meeting. So it would be a good time for, um, for somebody to be appointed um, if we could do that this summer, so. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of report, the only thing I would mention is uh, having watched uh, the energy committee function in the past week. Uh, Fred Davis has done a huge amount of work for the town. Um, the uh, Green Communities grant, I think, was probably due um, on Friday last week because there seemed to be a huge culmination of effort to, to try to work with the uh, town officials and get something done. So I just, I, I just watched it from afar as a, a member of the committee, but I did see a lot of emails flying and appreciated the work that Fred was doing. Um, so do we have anything else for this August group? Nope, Dinner. I, I move that we adjourn. Second. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Mr. Murphy. Aye. And Mr. Marcucci, definitely. <laughs> Thank you Good all. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Good night. All right. We're shameless in trying to keep people engaged in our conversation.